there is a small assemblage of farmers having a discussion nearby. The farmers are deep in conversation. You think it best not to interrupt them with idle chit-chat. The little old lady is tiny with twinkling blue eyes. Her white hair is done up in a neat bun on top of her head. She appears at first to be in her 60s. Then you notice the sheer quantity of makeup plastered on her face and decide that she may well be older than that. Ah, dragon fire! Oh, no, wait. It's just a mounted dragon head. Whew. A large and incredibly hefty-looking mallet is propped up against the shelf. A small engraving on its head reads, Broggy. It's a weather vane with the obligatory depiction of a rooster. An expensive-looking statue catches your eye. It is sculpted of white marble and appears to be the only item of any real value within the shop. You find it quite odd that this grand statue is situated amongst other ordinary items of far less value. Some old shields are lying around in the antique shop. Apparently, this interesting-looking item is a Model DX cartridge retrieval unit. Quite a useful little device in another time and place. Good afternoon. What can I do for you, dear? Hello. Do you sell anything that would aid an ascent up a mountain? Unfortunately, I do not sell climbing equipment, or anything of that sort. This is really a specialist store. Oh. However, I do have an item which you might find useful. This lamp... ...is said to contain a genie. Never tried it myself, of course. I do not believe in using magic to solve my problems. Nature has made us as we are. And we should be glad of that. Uh-huh. How much for the lamp? The old lady hesitates. You sense she wants more from you than your money. You hope it is not anything that you will regret. Well, seeing as how you are a man who seems adept at taking care of himself, perhaps you could do a small favor for me? Somehow, you knew she was going to say that. I once owned a beautiful nightingale. Quite rare around here, but the sentimental value far outweighs its monetary worth. That foul old witch, Hagatha, has stolen it from me, probably to use in some concoction or another. Her nose screws up in disgust. So, if you could be a sweetie and retrieve it for me, I will trade you. The lamp for the bird. Agreed? <sighs> well, I will see what I can do. Do be careful. If Agatha should spot you out of her good eye, then you'll be in for it. Here. This might help your sneezing. Oh, thanks! Here, you can have this back now. You retrieve the partially used cloth from the haystack. Feel better? Yeah, it's so good to be able to b b b b You take the silver needle. Yes? Could you recommend another good book? There! 
This book is entitled Legends. Browsing through it, you notice an interesting excerpt. Yes? Could you recommend another good book? There! This book is entitled Power, Politics, and Pulpits. Browsing through it, you notice an interesting excerpt. Unless you are mistaken, the symbol above the cave entrance bears a striking similarity to a bat. A shiver runs down your spine as you look at it. It's almost as if some dark force were radiating from it. It is a human skull with a radiant blue stone wedged into its eye socket. It is a human skull with large eye sockets. This skull already has a glowing blue gem. As you attempt to place the birth gem into the skull, you discover that it does not fit properly. Instead, it juts out uselessly like a bulging eyeball. You gently tap the birth gem with the mallet, hoping not to break it. It budges only slightly. You give it a harder hit. It moves a bit more. You hold your breath and give the gem an almighty thwack. It pops into the skull. As you face the skull towards the image of the bat above the cave, you notice that its wing has faded slightly. However, you suspect that whatever danger the bat represents is still in effect. You turn the rightmost skull so that it faces the bat symbol above the cave entrance. 
The power of the two skulls combined has caused the bat symbol to disappear. You sense whatever danger it represented has now subsided. As you enter, you are almost overwhelmed by the foul stench which molests your nostrils. It is obviously coming from whatever Hagatha is cooking in that large cauldron of hers. There are some things of interest on the other side of the cave, but you have no means of crossing over there safely at this time. A caged nightingale sits on the floor near the northern cave wall. The light from outside barely penetrates the interior of this cave. So long as you keep your distance, Hagatha shouldn't notice you. You need to get Being as quiet as a mouse, you slide your hand inside the cloak to discover a deep pocket. Amongst sticky and disgusting spell ingredients, you find a tiny silver key and a peculiar golden ring-shaped device. You hear Agatha begin a chant of some kind while stirring her brew. The fluid of blood with bone and flesh. It will make my complexion young and fresh. You need to get... Inducing time to reverse its sail. You slide the silver key into the lock. It fits. You turn it silently and the chain falls to the ground. You silently drop the cloth over the cage. Without making a sound, you take the nightingale into your possession. All I need is a sweet nightingale. You strike the skull with all your strength, and it shatters easily. The birth gem clatters to the ground, along with a multitude of bone fragments. You reacquire the birth gem. You remove the cloth from the cage. Looking at the bottom of the cage, you find that a letter has become stuck to it. You peel it off. The paper is slightly crumpled and dirty, having somehow become stuck to the bottom of a bird cage. You read the letter. The letter puzzles you, but you put it away and continue your quest.
You have run into an evil enchanter. Get out of here fast before he turns you into something. You offer the nightingale to Angelina. The sheer elation on her face almost makes the whole risk worth the while. She snatches it from you and proceeds to fuss over the bird. You wait for a moment, but it seems she no longer notices you. <coughs> if you don't mind, about the lamp you promised me and trade for the nightingale? The shopkeeper looks up at you vaguely. She gradually remembers that there is another being in her world. Yes? Oh, yes, take it. You'll have no beginning of use with it. Don't you mean no end of use? Of course. Whatever you say, dear. You hear Angelina muttering cheerfully to herself as she exits. Finally, I have the final ingredient for that marvelous youth potion. I'm going to beat you to the punch, my dear Hagatha. Serves you right for hoarding this sweet, juicy thing to yourself. You feel a nauseous tinge in your stomach. Well, at least the lamp is now yours. You take the old lamp. You rub the lamp and wait expectantly, but nothing happens. You're about to give it another try when a small puff of smoke appears at the end of the spout. It clears, revealing... A note? As you remove it, the lamp disappears. You read the scroll. Upon closer examination, you discover that the statue hides a small latch. You flip the latch and watch in amazement as a trap door opens up from the floor. You close the trap door behind you. You read the letter sitting on the desk. As you pick up the carpet, you notice a small label which reads, 
property of Al Din. There might be a faded letter or two in there, but you cannot be sure. Above you, from the back room, you discern Angelina's voice. I did it! I did it! The youth potion is finally finished. All I need to do now is drink it. Angelina, show yourself, you scurvy wench! Agatha? My dear! What an unexpected sur- Don't you play the fool with me! I know you stole it! <laughs> stole? Really, I do not know. Silence! For your lies and deceit, there can be only one consequence. No! Please! I can explain! I said silence! Oh, and one more thing. Your invitation to join us is revoked. What is this? Ah, the youth potion at last. Oh no! Drat! Now what was that spell for removing floorboards? Curses! I shall have to go back and look it up. You fish around in the pile of down and successfully retrieve the youth potion. Cautiously, you open the trap door ever so slightly and peer into the room above. Hagatha is nowhere to be seen. You make your exit from the basement. You close the trap door again before you leave. The carpet is woven of the finest fabric. There's not enough room to use the carpet. You have come upon a quick little dwarf. Dwarves have... You unroll the magic carpet, lay it on the ground, and sit on it. The carpet begins to rise skyward. As you ascend higher, you realize that the carpet is beyond your control. It glides through the air on a seemingly predetermined course. A snake blocks your path to the east. It appears to be about ten feet long and is coiled up, ready to strike.
you dangle the shimmering opal in front of the snake, it soon falls hypnotized in typical snake fashion. You reach into the cavity and feel around. What is this? You've discovered a button hidden inside the rock. You press it and wait to see what happens next. In an instant, a man stands beside you. He appears to be somewhat of an adventurer, much like yourself. Greetings. I am King Graham of Daventry. The newcomer nods in greeting. Without a word, he respectfully appraises you. You notice about him the manner of one who has only recently learnt the meaning of heroism. From where do you hail, good sir? The man opens his mouth to answer, but then pauses to consider that question. Evidently deciding that irrelevant exposition would serve neither party, he casually gestures to the hole in the rock behind you. Might I inquire something of your identity? After a brief search of his own person, the man pulls out a scroll card and hands it to you. You unroll it, and it reads, Having fulfilled the requirements in accordance with the statutes of the famous Adventurer's Correspondence School, the bearer is a qualified would-be hero. The man also shows you a medallion. Upon it are the words, Hero of Spielberg. You reverently return the scroll to the man. You don't say much, do you? With a sigh of resignation, the man shakes his head silently. Surely you might speak to me of your adventures. The man becomes quite enthused about the prospect of relating his most recent adventure to you. Just as he is about to speak, however... You notice something on the ground that the man must have dropped. You retrieve the paper. It appears to be a scroll. Upon it is some writing. Disclaimer, you have just witnessed a rather shameless plug for the remake of Quest for Glory 2 Trial by Fire by the entities of AGD Interactive. Available now. As you read the writing, the words are ingrained in your mind. The scroll disappears. You flip through the book entitled, Ye Old Book of Enchantments, Causes and Cures. The first half contains a list of enchantments. These do not interest you, as you have no desire to inflict inconvenience upon others. However, the Cures section does capture your curiosity. While browsing, you spy a promising paragraph. This is the sword of the first king of Daventry. It dates back almost 1,000 years and has been passed down from king to king since that time. Try not to damage it. A magnificent clear crystal is embedded within its hilt. You managed to dislodge the crystal that had been set within the hilt of the sword almost a millennium ago. You feel a tinge of guilt and wonder what all the past monarchs of Daventry would say if they saw you damaging ancient crown property. You approach the workbench for a closer look. A clear beaker. It is useful for mixing various fluids, chemicals, and minerals together. You toss the sickly yellow flower into the beaker. You toss the earrings into the beaker. You strike the blade of your sword against the flint stone. It sparks and the wick catches a light. 
You watch, fascinated, as the two unlikely objects melt under the heat of the magical flame. You stir the mixture carefully with a white feather. It soon dissolves in the hot liquid. You drop the crystal in and watch, amazed, as the green liquid slowly seeps into it. Heed now these words. Crystal, perfect. Green is thy hue. Restore, correct. Guard well my form. Preserve, protect. You recite the words correctly, line for line, and sure enough, only a brilliant emerald remains in the glass beaker. You quickly blow the flame out so as not to overheat the emerald and cause damage to it. Picking it up gingerly, you're amazed that the emerald took virtually no time at all to cool. As you direct the sun's light through the emerald at the snake, you behold a wondrous transformation. Before you now stands a magnificent winged horse. Thank you for freeing me. A horrid enchanter transformed me into that legless thing after I refused to be his steed. That was quite a gamble, to refuse an enchanter. True, but I could not have accepted, even if I had wanted to. For I am a disciple of the Cloud, and can serve no land dweller. Disciple of the Cloud? What does that mean? First, tell me of what you seek up here. You take a deep breath, then explain about the door of destiny, the gems of nature, and your present quest to locate the growth gem. So, you seek the air gem? Yes, that is right. You know of it? Most certainly. But you will not be able to reach it by any means available to you or any of your kind. I would gladly take you to it. But alas, the enchanter took and hid from me my bridle. Without it, we could search for a thousand years and still never find the cloud spirit. Where did he hide your bridle? I do not know. Perhaps a clue may be found in that blackguard's abode behind me. What is this spirit you speak of? The essence of what you seek. It passes through us as we grow, all through our lives, though few are ever aware of it. You will know soon enough when I take you to it. You notice that some writing has been engraved into the wall. You read the inscription. The engraving on the wall reads, In row of stones that number six, half and a pair from left do pick. Quell then my spell, avoid the tricks. A collection of books are stacked side by side on a nearby shelf. Most of the titles are written in a mysterious language that you don't understand. So you suspect that they are about magic. 
The cave is adorned with the most beautiful coverings you've ever seen. The material sparkles in the light from outside the cave. There's almost something unreal about this brilliant decor. You hear footsteps approaching. Uh-oh, the Enchanter has caught you in his lair. He twirls his hands, aims them at you, and then utters some words under his breath. You feel a tingling sensation all over your body as the enchantment attempts to transform you into whatever the Enchanter has fancied. At the same time, you also feel the comforting energy of the Emerald shielding you. The Enchanter's twisted smile turns downwards. He scowls at you. There is a look of panic on the man's face. He does not dare breathe. I hereby order you to depart from Kalima forever, never to trouble its citizens again, lest you were in the fullness of my wrath. The enchanter looks baffled. You sigh inwardly and try again. Leave. If you come back, then you will get it. The Enchanter nods frantically, as much as he can without cutting his own neck on your sword edge. He gestures quickly with his hands. There's not enough room to use the carpet here. Try walking in front of the rocks. You unroll the magic carpet, lay it on the ground, and sit on it. The carpet rises into the air again. The carpet begins to descend. You bend over and hold the emerald above the stone so that the sun's light channels through it. Incredible! The rock has transformed into a silver-studded bridle. You take the bridle. There's not enough room.
You unroll the magic carpet, lay it on the ground, and sit on it. The carpet begins to rise skyward. As you reach down to get the carpet, it vanishes into thin air without even so much as a puff of smoke. You slip the bridle over the horse's head. It whinnies its approval. Come, Come climb, climb upon, upon my back. back. Hold on. This will be a little accelerating. The disciple of the cloud gracefully soars high into the sky. You grip the reins tightly and hold on for dear life as he swoops and dips between the clouds. After a time, he draws near to a thick patch of luminous mist. As you pass through it, the horse sets itself down, seemingly on top of a cloud. It is all right. You can dismount now. Believing that you have finally lost all sense of reason, you dismount and prepare for a very long drop. And find yourself standing on a cloud.